If your websites conduct transactions or collect sensitive data, you have a material risk on your hands that could cost millions. The client-side security gap is being exploited daily with attacks like digital skimming, credential harvesting, and form jacking. 98% of sites use first and third-party JavaScript to power and enhance the user experience, opening up the client side to the adversary. Unlike most things in security, there is an easy fix. Start by understanding your risk. Let Source Defense give you a site-wide risk report this week. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash source defense. Right now, everybody is talking about cryptocurrency, and the cyber criminals are hiding in the conversation. Cyber criminals use social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on your company, your employees, and your customers. Spear phishing is just one of 13 types of email threats. Barracuda has identified these 13 types and shows you how you can protect your company, your customers, and your reputation. Find out about the 13 email threat types and Barracuda email protection. Get your free ebook at securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. If you have a specific guest or topic you'd like us to cover on one of the upcoming shows, submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests. Complete that form, and we'll get that. Review your suggestions on pretty much a weekly basis here yeah. at Security Weekly and reach out to you once they've been reviewed. Yep. Don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings at securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. And now, the security news with myself, Mr. Larry Pesce, and Mr. Lee Neely. Woo-hoo. Lee, welcome. Oh, it's so good to be here on yes. a Wednesday afternoon enjoying... Something really fun. Absolutely. Um, I don't want to overload our audience with firmware security stories because I, <laughs> it's my world now. And that's what I pay attention to because it's part of my day job uh, at Eclipsium as the firmware security evangelist. So Your, your new day job. My relatively new. Uh, it's been about uh, actually today exactly one month uh, wow. at Eclipsium. And I'm already I'm loving it. And you can't... But you, I can't wait to release my first blog post. Um, it's nearing completion. It's in the review mm-hmm. stages, uh, and I'm, I'm super excited about it. Um, but we'll leave that to another time. Let's start with non-firmware security related stories uh, to kick things off. Let's start with something a little uh, lighter, on the lighter side, to ease okay. us into some of the stories. Um, apparently, there's an entire YouTube channel dedicated to the movie Hackers. It's called hackers curator and they've got a whole bunch of videos all right not not that many but a bunch of videos all related to the movie hackers like i it, it the cult following it amazed amazes me still to this day but they didn't interview i saw it some i don't know how i found it to be honest with you but uh matthew lillard who played serial killer in the movie hackers who was also in scream scooby-doo I miss one of his other bigger movies. <clears throat> yeah, one of his, he had another big, seems like a really nice guy. Didn't interview with these, uh, these folks that run this podcast. They produced a YouTube video as well. <clears throat> and uh, I, I thought it was pretty good. I watched the first half of it. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, Matthew <clears throat> seems like a really nice guy. That's awesome. And was uh, very candid about, you know, his impressions when he first read the script. Like he got a, <laughs> we were talking with Andy on the break, right, about the movie Hackers and kind of like, it is ridiculous. It's not the greatest film as we would, you know, rank uh, a true film. But it was uh, a good movie. But it was a great, it was a great flick, right? Like it's it, was, great, it was a great movie. It was great, great entertaining. Movie. Entertaining, style-wise, again, amazing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it certainly wasn't winning any awards. <clears throat> I mean, it wins awards in my book, yeah. but not from like awards places that would rank movies. From the... Right? Film community, correct. <laughs> it's from the you know from the fan from the fan community yeah. uh, basically, and so I thought it was cool. I haven't watched uh, the other videos on this channel. I, I definitely have it on my list. Like they interview the executive VP of production uh, yeah. and like all all these people like involved with the film, which is uh, Fisher Stevens is the guy that plays the plague, and he was big in the nineties. I don't know what other I couldn't tell you what other movies Fisher Stevens was in. In the '90s, can you can you Larry? You're nope. you're and you're a film buff. Too. I'm, a, I'm a movie buff. You're a movie buff. Film buff. Film buff. Right. Yep. 
as, so I, as I've gotten older, my tastes have evolved a little bit, so I've become more of a film buff, but I'm still a movie buff at heart. Fisher Stevens was in movies like Short Circuit. Oh. Right? Oh. <laughs> Remember that movie? Oh, my God, yes. Johnny Five is alive. Do not disassemble. Right. No, disassemble. <laughs> like, that was one of my favorites growing up. <sighs> yes. Wow. He's, he's been in lots of stuff. Lots of you stuff. Know, like Isle of Dogs. Yes. Law and Order. Uh-huh. Grand Budapest Hotel. Ooh. That's a film. It's right? a film. Uh, right? Californication. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so pretty, I mean, I'll pretty to, cool. We'll like, have to go, we'll definitely have to go check that out. Yeah. Go I mean, if you're a fan of the uh, movie hackers, you definitely want to check out this YouTube channel. It's one of those, again, like, ran, I don't know how I found, I couldn't tell you how I found, I, I saw it in something I had flagged. Uh, this week when I was, you know, I don't Dude, know if you, I was flipboard. You went, you went, you went down the YouTube rabbit hole. Like, do you no, know it wasn't even that. Like, I was, I used to uh, just full disclosure. Right? I use a, an app and website called Flipboard, where you can subscribe to certain topics. Mm. Uh, my feed mm -hmm. reader is an online feed reader called called Feedly, uh, where you can follow RSS feeds and topics and things like that. It's pretty cool. Um, and so I use both of those to collect stories for this show to. Uh, flag things that I'm working on to follow for my day job firmware security uh, things that we um, that we publish in uh, Eclipsium's you know monthly below the surface thing. Um, so I use it for all of those are the things I use, and I just happened to come across this, and I thought mm -hmm. I thought it was cool. Oh, they have an episode strictly on Lord Nikon's laptop, right? <laughs> like, yeah, that, like that, that's some serious like nerdy hackers movie yeah. stuff, right there. L like I'm I'm telling you, you go. You, you, just for me, like Wikipedia is the worst, uh, but I can also get down very much the YouTube rabbit hole. Yes. And like you just watch something on YouTube and you, you see over on the right hand side, like, you know, related videos or something like this. And then you're like, oh, oh you check that one out. Yeah. And oh. then you subscribe to that channel and oh, you get. Oh, yeah. Then. <sighs> yep. Like, I, I'm a car ish guy, mm -hmm. but I don't work on my own cars you just like to watch videos about them and google knows that about you it does yeah. it totally does because then like, google tells facebook that that happens yep. and then when you're flipping mm. through your facebook reels if you're like me and you've watched a couple on fishing because mm -hmm. my my kids and i love to go fishing mm -hmm. and all of a sudden all you're seeing is fishing videos yep. and that like, gets you click on the first one and then uh, it's like oh like my god I, turn it off close the app like close I, the app like i don't it was maybe a, a year and a half ago oh no, no almost two years ago at this point i ended up on uh cletus mcfarland's youtube channel who does like redneck racing and he's gotten way bigger than that now and then the next thing i know i'm watching vice grip garage and b is for build and sam crack and rich rebuilds like I have yeah. more car video subscriptions in my YouTube thing than I think. <laughs> and else that, then this, I like, found this other ridiculous. I, so I'll segue into like another random article that I found reading through my feeds. Yeah, the Mars Express space, spacecraft is finally getting a Windows ninety eight upgrade. <laughs> and I don't know. Oh, I couldn't glean from the article like, is it going from Windows ninety eight to Windows? Uh, no, it's, ME, probably, it's probably getting Windows, service pack one finally. Like, is it? <clears throat> what, was it Windows ME that was the the horrible oh, one yes, after? Yep. Yeah, Millennium Edition. Millennium right? Edition. <clears throat> yep. But Windows. it says something about that in here. Hold on, I have to find the quote because I giggled a lot. Where is it? Does it talk about ME? Hold on. Mm. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. 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 Oh, thankfully for humanity. And the red planet's sake, the ESA isn't upgrading its systems to Windows ME. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought that was uh, hilarious. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, but like, I don't know in the article what it says it's being updated to. The Marsa software was originally designed over 20 years ago using a development environment based on Microsoft Windows 98. 98. Um, mm -hmm. uh, high in resolution since data. 03. So it's got to have been 2099 is the latest they were touching it. Right. Detailed, oh, so they haven't detailed the exact software that the Mars site, Marsis is being upgraded to, but it's unlikely the team has upgraded the CPU and enabled TPM 2.0 <laughs> in the BIOS to get Windows 11 installed. <laughs> dude, this dude, dude, it's like the Verge did a great <laughs> job writing this article so nerds like us yeah. would giggle when, dude, we, when dude, we read it's, it. It's yeah. probably getting like Service Pack 1 or something like that. <laughs> right. But you talk about doing uh, over-the-air software updates. To space. Like, to, to like 
over, and not over, like a over, short distance over in Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Yeah. Holy crap! It like, may take a few years just to get the update say, to the space. I was going to say they, pro they probably yeah. kicked it off soon after Service Pack One was released, and it's just now completing. Correct. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Oh my goodness! Oh, well, yeah. think Amazing. about this. That old OS has been operating flawlessly for 19 years, right? Without That's anybody the patching it or nothing, you right? Know, I mean, the three of us have seen older software. I mean, like when we started in computing there was software that at that time was older mm -hmm. serving a purpose that would run and it was our job to maybe replace and or update mm -hmm. those systems so like this cycle has been going on lady your point <clears throat> which is a double like security wise not great older software works now, now that <laughs> like, said we've uh, talked about legacy system no much because it works now that's don't said, touch it to, to lee's point we don't know how many times it's actually been rebooted mm. right well but I would also say we can count the number of, on, on one hand, the number of users that have sat down in front of that interface. Correct. <laughs> that, <laughs> I mean, that's the interesting thing when you put something up in a space, right? When you do an update, there's no going to the data center oh, to, I mean, to go get hands-on keyboard to fix an issue. I mean, to Lee's point that it, you know, it has been up and it's been stable, we don't know how, it's been, how many times it's been rebooted, so right. we can't you know, say how stable it's been. But we also haven't had a user in front of it to manipulate it to make it unstable. So Right. I think it's also amazing that but like Lee the, makes a really good point. Like we had a system, and the 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 fans on the power supply stopped spinning. That's what I learned during the the break. Mm. But when you put a system in space, you gotta. Is there a lot? There must not be a lot of dust in space either. I mean, nope. there's a lot of dust in our server. Not a lot of heat either. And not a lot of heat. So yes, the, you have the correct. you have, you have the, the opposite problem. problem, right? Yep. But what you do have is a lot of radiation. Yes. <clears throat> Cosmic radiation. Bingo. In fact, yes. Like, and I love that fact that you said that uh, that your son learned about when you turn the yes. TV on, it has all of the, the black and white. And it's static. cosmic radiation. And like right. 1% of that is cosmic radiation. Right. Like, also how we got the Fantastic Four, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I'm just making myself giggle. <laughs> no, it's, good, it's a good show already. It's, it's a good show already. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh okay, goodness. so now can we talk about... For, no, I'm just kidding. Let's talk about some of your... Oh, so I actually... I, yeah, kindly. I had a fun one that uh, Larry also put as one of his stories. I, I actually saw it and thought of him. Mm. And that was your Rolling Pwn. Yeah. Uh, was this the drone, the drone one? Number two. Nope. Nope. This is the uh, the Rolling Pwn oh. software-defined radio <coughs> um, attacks for... Um, Honda. Uh, attacking Honda. Honda. And Honda's been under a lot of scrutiny lately uh, because, what, they had uh, unoriginal rice patty, um, which was uh, unauthenticated, effectively um, capture and replay attacks against various key fobs mm -hmm. of um, the late model and not so late model, uh, up to sure. like 2021 models of specific models of cars and their key fobs. And now the ones that feature rolling code technology have also been broken. So there were key fobs that did not have rolling code the code was static correct as late as 2020 or in 2021 in some models of uh honda automobiles what i thought was interesting about this article and Lee, i i want your feedback as well but um your customers this particular kind of integral cross goes but honda said like they weren't going to fix older versions Right, right. Because I read that somewhere. Because how do you fix older versions? You have to ish. Do you? Is it a firmware update to the car plus a new key fob? It or it, it may, some it, combination, it may, it, right? It's right. definitely a firmware update to the car, and, right? And you can't do in, in many of these late model older ones. It's not a remote firmware right, update, right? Right, and and I think this is one of the things that I think that uh, uh, Tesla had some issues with their key fobs, and they could they could do over the air software update. The problem is, is that the key fobs didn't support the software update, so they had to make it backwards compatible until you got a new key fob, and you didn't get those key fobs for free. You had to pay like three to five hundred dollars for your new key fob. So, oh. how many people did it? it? I'm sorry, it was the bleeping computer article that stated uh, bleeping computer reached out to Honda. The official statement says Honda has no plans to update older vehicles. Mm -hmm. Right, because the, the, the recall on something like that would consist of pretty much 95% of the Honda vehicles sold in the last 10 years. And from what I understand, and again, I'm like, I'm not a big 
car person mm-hmm. uh, and like i follow it a, a little bit right my, my some of my family members are big car people yep. but in in my my father-in-law is like uh norm from cheers <laughs> uh-huh. right like always just has these like amazing facts <laughs> like that are just totally random and so he'll be like just out of the blue be sitting there like having having some bourbon and just sitting around and be like paul do you know what the number one like most sold vehicle or the vehicle that uh model manufacturer and model car that is the most number on the road today 2006 honda accord yeah and it's it so but like there's always these <laughs> pop quizzes from papa lee and i'm like i i don't know papa lee what is it and papa lee is like it's the honda accord hmm. is like the most popular which is why i've also read articles and heard facts that like the uh rate of theft and the expense of something like an airbag for a Honda mm-hmm. Accord is yep. so high, high right? right? Because there's right, so many right. of them; they yep. all need to, you know, be replaced yep. or, or whatever, right? So, 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 so. But now, Honda. Now, put this in the context yeah. of this article: if Honda needs to issue a recall mm-hmm. for something like an Accord or a Civic, which are both really popular cars yep. here in the U.S., that's a lot of cars. So now exactly. everyone's bringing them to deal it right, and now you got to do a firmware update on and, all. And it, and it may, the, and it may the, actually the be a hardware, and it may actually be a hardware update. And it could for be a both the car and yeah. the key fob. Yeah, the, we have an understanding of how you know this low-level hardware and firmware yep. works in a lot of these devices. It's not all that dissimilar from device, whether it's a car or router yeah. or whatever it is, right? Like it's firmware and yep. hardware it's, it, and it, stuff. It, it feels like a logic bomb because apparently, if you send the right sequence of consecutive lock unlock it causes the counter that's that's to reset and and doesn't and and allows unallowed codes to work in other words they're uh you know your 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 rolling codes that should be done are, are able to be reused yeah. and uh yeah it's like it's like a problem it's, it's like a problem with a random number generation random number generator yeah. as it were because uh you know lee exactly the same sort of thing like uh they resynchronize uh a counter every time the car is locked and unlocked mm. And that counter is used to derive the rolling code. So yeah. Now, but at- th- th- and this isn't the first time we've seen. I mean, we've seen this <clears throat> with BMW, I believe. I yep. mean, many yep. car manufacturers I mean, have y- had this problem. Since <clears throat> and, and Larry, you know this, right? Because you teach the classes mm-hmm. on it. That the techniques and hardware and software to be able to study and mm-hmm. research the problems and come up with a, a, a hack for it, for lack of a better term, have become more readily available. Like oh, yeah. It takes me back to like 2004 wireless hacking where it was expensive and kind of difficult mm-hmm. to get 802.11 gear. Yep. And then that became... <laughs> Super, super cheap. Right, right. I, th- I like. I super think accessible. Like, like I think about uh, Josh Wright um, injecting <laughs> keystrokes into the clicker key fob remote. Right. On Kevin Johnson's laptop while he was doing a presentation because Kevin said it's totally secure. You can't do that. And that required Josh to. And have, that's all Josh needs to hear. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. Josh had to have a thirty-five hundred dollars software-defined radio. Right. And, at that time, and, that was and probably two thousand eight, yeah, nine, yeah. And, and probably five hundred hours of coding time and research. And no, he did not spend five hundred hours on that. Did oh, I he? believe he. I believe he did. Wow. Over over uh, an eighteen month period. I remember that research. Period. Yeah. I remember over an eighteen month period. And now, like, that is an attack that you can deliver in a thirty dollar dongle with some free and open source software. And if I remember correctly, you can probably even do it with your uh, Flipper Zero. Like right, uh, right, some commodity stuff, and same sort of thing has happened with so many of these other attacks. But has the protections against that gotten better as a result no. of that research? As of now, no. Mm. That's um, the concerning part for me. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. And, right? and like even if Josh proved it, yep, which is a tremendous feat, and he deserves amazing respect for that. And it took him expensive heart. I mean, relative relative terms mm-hmm. to what we have today right expensive mm-hmm. hardware lots of time yep that's been improved the attacks have improved faster than we've been able to as an industry Street. not we as certain secured professionals sure. right but as an industry Street. they've been able to implement protections yep. that's a recipe for disaster mm-hmm. and a failure uh, i mean almost a failure on what we have fronts. here martin is a failure to communicate no, yeah just... but i mean 
<laughs> it, I mean, we don't want it to be a failure of security professionals, but in a way, we, we have failed because we haven't affected change. But also, there's a responsibility on the manufacturer sure. side. Like, they haven't improved as well. And it could be they're just not economic incentives, and maybe we've worked really hard mm-hmm. as in, uh, security professionals and researchers to affect that change, but yep. it hasn't happened. So right. I think there's a shared... And I think that a shared failure in that sense, which is, uh, I hate to put that on security researchers, but things haven't gotten better and more and more secure as a result, which means we still have more work to do. Yeah. And I think the automotive industry as a whole, based on my experience with them, they've gotten way better at realizing oh, yeah. some of these types of sure. things. Um, and maybe, again, maybe they are still lagging behind in some of the research strictly. And I, this is my opinion, my opinion only in that the strictly because of their development life cycle, Mm. is three to five years behind current Mm -hmm. like when they commit to a design they're committed to a design now and that design will not see the road for three to five years because of the what is the uh Development regulatory life. body that Deve- regulates develop- automobiles. Development life cycle, uh, regulatory body. But what is the regulatory NSHTA, body? NSHTA, a uh, bunch of them. National bunch Transportation of. Safety Stand. What is the... There's a bunch of them. Uh, but there's one in particular that... It kind of like the FDA, if you want to bring a new drug to market, <clears throat> yep. has to validate that, right? And it, there's a huge, the, there, long there's all process. So, there's all right. sorts of things that they need to consider. Mm-hmm. And... Like just development life cycle. Like this is not a fast process for developing. Is these it NTSB, systems. National Tr- Na- National yeah. Transportation Safety Board? Yeah, NTSB yeah, is one of yeah, them. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But there's all sorts of regulations depending on what markets you're going into, and you know whether it's commercial or you know that type of stuff. Um, no. NH- or, or self driving. NHTSA. NH. Uh, yeah, NHTSA. The safety of motor vehicles and r- regulated equipment. Yep. Yes. Lee, this is a great article. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so many, so many things. But yeah, they're like they're on a three to five year delay for what they say now. Like you go to um, <clears throat> thinking about like, you know, the in dash entertainment units, like the in dash entertainment units, like they've got this proof of concept, they've got it working and they've got a freeze on release development. Three and three years later, that in dash unit makes it into an automobile that is on the road and they developed this around android mm. three year old android <coughs> frozen no updates like it's this version and it is this version only and how many versions of android do we go through in three have years you, have you played with any <laughs> android emulated environments on linux it's been a little bit but yes which one did you oh, gosh you would ask me that I was not successful yet in uh, getting one running, um, but Michael Bazell's podcast, um, mm-hmm. OS in Privacy Secure. Yep. What is the name of his podcast? OS in, in Privacy Podcast. What is... Either way. I'm sorry, Michael. We, well, I've been talking with Michael uh, ab- about stuff. He recently re-released his tools, um, yep. the OS in tools. Right, but he has a, a podcast, the Privacy Security and OS Int Show, which I've been digging lately because he's been talking mm. a lot about Linux. One mm-hmm. of the things that he recommends in Linux is Anbox, which is mm. an Android emulator that lets you run Android apps in an emulated environment on Linux. He has a very specific way to set that up. And I think one of the reasons why I, when I was following his tutorial, it didn't work is because my processor's AMD, my kernel's slightly different. Hmm. Um, and, and he was reporting that users have said like they followed his tutorial and didn't quite work on, yep. their, on their machines. I don't think that's his fault. I think that's yeah. the Linux kernel team plus the Anbox team, <laughs> like just, you know, Linux open source stuff. Yep. Um, the, so the, I'm not putting the, that the, on Michael. The, but the, like, last time, the last time I tried, I ended up in dependency hell for some of the... Yeah, that's and, where I'm and at, too. I was using yes. the, the uh, quote, official Android SDK sure. type route, okay. and I ended up with a whole host of issues. Check out Anbox. Linux. Anbox has a snap package hmm. that you can install on Ubuntu-based uh, systems, but even at that, I was having um, some some issues... But again, like I didn't spend a whole ton of time. I was like, my use case was like, oh, it'd be really cool to get some of like my camera apps 
running on my native desktop, you know, <laughs> versus like maybe going yep. to the web interface on my local DVR yep. kind mm-hmm. of thing and having some of the monitoring uh, on my Android apps. He uses it for something called my sudo. And my sudo was like something for having different uh, personas talk, text, uh. email, browse, pay privately and securely. Uh, so it was an app for Android, but he wanted to be able to control that on, on his computer. Gotcha. So lots of, I mean, I tell you what, the, the name does it a disservice as a tangent, right? Privacy, security, and OSN show. Like lots of really cool Linux tips. Uh, I, I, would, I met someone this week who is making the transition from Mac OS uh, to Linux and, and wanted mm-hmm. to talk with me about, because I made that transition years ago and <clears throat> wanted to just talk about stuff. And I recommended um, Michael Bazell's uh, podcast and notes because he also has, I put this in Slack too, a magazine on Redacted Magazine hmm. um, that talks about privacy, security, and uh, open source intelligence gathering. And his magazine is awesome. You can go to unredactedmagazine.com. He has three issues posted, and they're like all really cool articles that are not just necessarily privacy related, but like all kinds of cool stuff and cool stuff with Linux because he likes Linux because Windows and Apple have privacy implications. When you run Mac OS or Windows, it's talking back to the mothership sure. and, and leaking stuff. So from a privacy mm-hmm. perspective, Michael's a huge proponent of Linux, which like in its nature gives him the, the uh, opportunity to talk about Linux-based stuff because he wants to run Linux for privacy reasons, but benefits really anyone that runs Linux that wants to run these applications. So he publishes the actual issues in like a really nice PDF format, but then has a text file with all the commands that you can easily <laughs> copy and paste. Nice. I'm like, Mike, you're doing great work. Props to you. Um, and, and Michael and I have been talking and, and he's doing great stuff and I just wanted to support him there. And, but back to cool. Android and emulation and box, uh, if, if you haven't looked into it, is, is something I'm looking into as well. A N B O. Yeah, A N B O. I don't know how we got because we went we went from in vehicle entertainment to in dash to entertainment Android and you to mentioned Android, Android to, and that's yep. and that's how we got there. Right. Sounds like we need to get you back teaching five seventy five, Larry. Um, my plate is Android full. emulator. My plate is full. Well, yeah. So, so yeah, <laughs> I so never how, said but, you could actually fit it on your schedule. <clears throat> right, right. But yeah, between oh, oh and I had a link. Take it. I Maybe had a link it. for you, Larry. Oh. Uh, did I? Yes, dy- my story number fifteen: dynamic analysis of firmware components in IoT devices, uh-huh. and they talk Ooh. about some stuff that I saw. Um, the Renode platform, Renode platform, uh, Renode is an emulated platform oh. for IoT devices that I have not yet played with, and everyone knows my affinity towards mm-hmm. emulating firmware um, and stuff like that. Ooh. They also talk about Q-ling? Chemo? Chemo? Q-ling? Oh, no. Okay. Q-I-L-I-N-G. Q-ling. 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 Yeah. Q-ling. Uh, as another um, framework. So compared to QMU, the Q-ling framework can emulate more platforms and provide flexible configuration of emulated processes, including the capability to modify executing code on the fly. Mm. Which is, so it can emulate Windows or QNX executables on Linux and vice versa. Like just notes. Again, we talked about your... Uh, mentioned your IoT security class, yep. right? Is that the, the class you wrote? Is that what it's called? IoT? Yep. Uh, IoT hacking for pen yeah. testers. Effectively. So some cool yeah. tools that not only start on in this article, but I've also seen in practice uh, as well. <clears throat> and both of these frameworks I have not personally played with yet. And one of the reasons I added it was kind of as a, a, a bookmark for Paul for something to go back into research in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Again, like nothing new or earth shattering there, but if you're doing firmware research or firmware emulation on the IoT side or whatever, yep. uh, something you want to take a look at. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've always taken the approach of that you don't necessarily need to emulate, but because um, there's other ways around that problem. But certainly, well, it emulate, depends on it, your goals, right? right like if right. you're if you're researching to find vulnerabilities and memory corruption flaws in an yeah. IoT device, and you want to emulate that IoT device and run a debugger on it, that, that the, seems to me the, the use this case, right? Yeah. So certainly you can you know, accomplish that much more difficultly with reverse engineering and you know, right. decompiling and all that type of and stuff. And having the actual device doesn't always 
provide the luxury of running a debugger on that device, Correct. which is why we emulate the firmware and then put attach a debugging process to it. Correct. Um, so some pretty cool projects out there for yep. for doing that. This article covered uh, two that I've not yet. Uh, Lee, Lee, you we, like we had uh, Samil on the show that produces an amazing course. Lee, you uh, had something to get a comment in there. Yeah, so I was saying, given that the Quilling framework is written in Python, how is it that Paul hasn't downloaded and already started to hack it? <laughs> I know, right? There's only so many hours in the day, man. Like, you know, <laughs> so much cool stuff out there. Like, just when you think you might have found the stuff that you want to research, there's always more that I'm like, oh, there's this other project that you does it, right? Have, dude, you have no idea. Um, you know, when yeah. we, we get folks on a Zoom call and they see my office and yes. what's behind me, um, they're like, man, that's a lot of stuff. I'm like, yeah, my projects have projects. Yep. It, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, yeah, I mean, my comment notwithstanding, this looks really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something to, to check out for sure. Uh, I, I do want to transition to the Microsoft world for a bit. I uh -huh. want to talk about uh, two things, their auto patch feature and their macro security <laughs> challenges. Because I think uh, the macro one's kind of... I don't know how much we want to talk about this, right? But like, you know, Microsoft have macros and they're like, well, we're going to restrict it. And then... No, no, and then people it, use then maybe still not. Worry. People were. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, we're going to kill it all together. And like, no, nah, we're not going to kill it no, all together because like people still use it. So there's that whole conundrum. So Microsoft has paused the once touted right. security challenge is the... Uh, there's all kinds of ads. Uh, in this one, in the story, <laughs> which ironically comes from SC Magazine, which is a CRA company. Um, and you don't have your ad blocker turned on for your own? No. You know what? It's funny. <laughs> Not for that one because they're a CRA property. I need to be able to look at the site without an ad blocker to verify that ads and stuff are working. Which Feedback. Is hilarious. <laughs> Too many ads. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, Microsoft said uh, that it would roll back a default block of VBA macros downloaded from the internet. I think yep. we talked about this, right? We may have. This right. is the whole back and forth of, yep. we're going to prevent macros then, from running. We're going to restrict it. No, we're not. And then yes, they will we roll are. back this change no, based no, on we're not. feedback. Feedback. <laughs> and people going, oh my God, you can't take away my macros. That's pretty much the whole well, story. I mean, there's really right. not much more to tell. Enough. Big enough. Customers said this is having a huge business impact and you're going to have to pause it. Yeah. Um, but the good news is they've got some GPOs you can roll out in your own organization that'll do the same thing. That's good. Yeah, that's good. great advice, Lee. And, and that's the advice I was looking for, Lee. That's and, great feedback. And Lee, the question that I have about those GPOs, like specifically they're saying in these articles that uh, they're going to disable VBA macros from documents downloaded from the internet. Right. Does that still apply on those GPOs or is it just disable VBA no, macros? It's just internet. Okay. And even better, even more so, you can take... One that's downloaded from the internet, and you can do a properties on it. It's got that security. It's from the internet. You uncheck that, and it's oh, that's not from the internet anymore. I'll follow whatever yeah. on macros. Trust account. me, I'm from the internet. But like, what would customers do if Microsoft did disable macros? Would they be like, oh, oh that'd be all well, we're we're picking up shop and we're going to somewhere. Like, what are they going to do? Run LibreOffice on Linux? Like, no, they're not going to do that, dude. Like, they they can't no. remove mm. macros entirely because there are so many business processes worldwide that rely on macros. Office right. macros that mm -hmm. they would be doing themselves and every business on the planet that uses one, which is every business, a disservice. Like, so, I mean, businesses are built on Excel. I mean, yeah. most I, competition I to security solutions is, a, is, is a, Excel. It, you, know, you know how Windows UAC has that you can adjust the level of impact, you know, from bug me every freaking time to let me just click OK. <laughs> You need something like that for macros where somebody could say, now you got to put a password in or an admin password before you enable macros if somebody really doesn't care about the risk and just let yeah. them click OK and turn it on. Right now, the setting in the in the, you know in, in Word or Spreadsheet, it's just so easy to go click, you're on your way without yep. even thinking about it. Did you guys Raise see the the, this auto patch feature? No. That sounds interesting. It, it, it seemed... On one hand, it seemed to me like but this is but something... But they'll only do it on Wednesday nights from between 6 and 11. Right. There's that, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, administrators are in control of that. But this is, I think, what many enterprises have done for a long time in that you get a new patch from Microsoft and you 
in your own policies in the enterprise, roll it out to a select group of workstations. And then if that goes well, you roll it out to the next group of workstations and so on and so forth. And you create what Microsoft has dubbed kind of these rings. And from what I gleaned from this article, and again, I'm not like the, the world's best, you know, Windows security it advice uh person like it's i'm more of a linux person as, as most of you know right but so there's like a, a test ring from the article that contains a minimum number mm. of representative devices the first ring is slightly larger it's one percent of devices under management the fast ring contains nine percent of endpoints right it kind of sounds like the same thing but a very like if you look at the graph in the article that i link to like it's it's really complex as to how they've created these layers. I worry that it's a little too complex to kind of understand and roll out in your organization and that maybe you're better off defining your own policies for this, but it seems like Microsoft wanted to make it easier for folks to create these, these Did, rings and apply I think auto Microsoft patches. wanted to make it easier for what many administrators and many organizations are already doing mm. manually. Mm -hmm. so i mean the automation is key i'm just not sure this isn't this is targeted at the big organization who's automated the snot out of this already it's somewhere in the middle Mm -hmm. right it's not your mom and pop shop that isn't even going to have ad or an or an e3 license with microsoft but something small business up medium business maybe who hasn't really got their arms around this they haven't created these rings yet so microsoft will create them for you because they Microsoft says they create four test rings, each of them representative of all the diversity in the enterprise, which is different from what I've recommended in the past is that rather than creating diverse rings, in other words, take 1% of your global users and roll the patch out and see what happens, which isn't a bad approach. I've kind of recommended take your most technical users, put them in a group and deploy the patches to them first. And, and let the more technical people sort it out first, right? Which has its flaws as well, because if the more technical people are the folks administering your network, if they run into issues, it could impede their ability to administer the network. So, I mean, in that sense, I kind of like the a diverse ring, right? You got one person, you know, a few people from IT, a few people from human resources, a few people from finance, a few developers, whatever, roll it out Mm -hmm. to a subset of those users first and like Mm -hmm. do you always roll out to the same set of users maybe it's a random random Mm. not Mm, random machine in in or person in that group that you roll it out to uh each time i don't know i mean it has to be highly customized to your organization in this in this sense i'll 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 admit that my machines belong to a group of early adopters in my enterprise and you can self volunteer for that and we right. see the patches before the the mass rollout and you have a chance to give feedback and the, the the team adjusts but usually it's it's a snooze there's nothing going in these days we've done it long enough but every now and then yeah i think yeah. i think you're <clears throat> everyone i was gonna go on a limb and say like most updates in the windows environment mm-hmm. yeah. are pretty you know, pretty innocuous. Every right? great once in a but while, they upgrade the version of Java, and oh crap, there goes my not even Java. I mean, it could be any. Uh, I mean, what comes down in a Windows update can be. I mean, it's configurable. First of all, right? This is this is where you get into all the different nuances and some of the concerns, right? Like, what what do you get in a Windows update? Is it applications? Is it the OS? Is it the kernel? Is it firmware? Is it drivers? It, it's all those things, but depending on how you configured it, right? And your impact might depend on, one, what updates you've chosen to update in Windows Update, and two, yeah. what hardware and software that you have, right? Like, if you got mm-hmm. a Microsoft, I have a Microsoft Surface Pro 3, and so, like, my question was, what, what comes down in updates? Because it's a Microsoft laptop, I'm like, mm-hmm. I would think my firmware BIOS all of that stuff would come from Microsoft in, in Windows Update. I don't, and it's like the, the, the I'm Google, not sure it's yet. Like, it's like, like buying the Google phone, yeah. the version, as opposed right. to the Huawei version. Right. But like, right. my thing is, I, I don't know for sure. 
And also, maybe that depends on what version of Surface Pro I have. Ooh. Is it a two or is it a three? <laughs> so that's, oh, yeah. It, it, I, I'm not just talking about firmware too, but also drivers. Also, the different types of to go back to different types of firmware. Right? Is it my EC firmware? Is it hmm? is it my ME? Is it my UEFI? All those are different firmware mm-hmm. subsystems in my laptop, and that is dependent on. Maybe what version of Surface Pro I have. Maybe what window in my Windows 10 or 11 that might make a in, a difference in terms of what gets updated and what the impact is. So, unbeknownst to Paul, we replaced his firmware with a special version. Watch now as we exercise those features. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Will he notice? Will he notice? Yep. Uh, Will re- he notice the keystroke logger in my EC firmware? Yeah. Re- mm-hmm. rela- re- somewhat related. Um, I uh, turned on a Chromebook uh, we hadn't used in a, in a couple months. Uh, and it uh, got the little flashy message just yep. saying, "Hey, this version of Chrome OS will no longer get updates. And uh, if you want to update, you got to buy something. Buy new one. Yeah, buy something yep. new. Like, oh, good, I can install Linux on this again. Right <laughs> type of thing. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <coughs> if you can install Linux on, uh, I can because it's the same version of the one that I already installed." <laughs> My question from a firmware perspective in, in getting some unique insights into that is Chromebooks run an open source version of your UEFI by bio, your BIOS or UEFI sure. called Core Boot. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. They also, Google has an open source version of your EC firmware. Huh. Your EC firmware is embedded controller on most laptops, have some embedded controller mm-hmm. that controls your. Like, you know how your power button on your laptop yep. is a button on the keyboard? It's not yeah. a, sometimes it's a physical, but yep. a lot of it's a button. And you have other buttons on your keyboard where you can adjust your screen brightness. Sure. And then you have a battery um, mm-hmm. that is also has firmware but interacts with the embedded controller. So the embedded controller firmware, uh, as I've learned recently, is updatable. And sometimes you don't get an update for it after a certain time, right? right. But is embedded controller with firmware that controls all of those functions: your function keys, your keyboard, your screen, uh, and interfaces with your battery as well. Mm-hmm. On uh, Google, on Chromebooks, has an open source EC firmware uh, that can be adopted. Like Framework adopts their open source EC nice. firmware, but on their BIOS. They've gone with inside like H2O, which is a, a commercial bias. Yeah. They've licensed the, the source code. So you, yep. you know, pay attention to that. But like, if you put Linux on it, I'm wondering if you've got sometimes better control in mm-hmm. now you can apply the open source version to your EC firmware and the open source version of Core Boot and be up to date, even though Google may not be supporting right. it. <clears throat> maybe Core Boot and maybe their open source EC firmware is like, hey, I got an update for you. So you can be up to date on your Linux mm-hmm. uh, and, and kernel and <clears throat> operating system and up to date at least on your UEFI and your EC controller yeah. because and, of open and, source. And those are great questions because the version of the Chromebook that I picked up, I mean, it's been four years since I picked this up. Yeah. Um, and, and Chromebook, like, what did you pay for four years ago? I, right? I like a couple I, hundred bucks? I think, or, well, yeah. it was a little bit high end at the time. Sure, so yeah. it was like, it was probably $300. Okay. Like $350 maybe. Yeah. Um, After four years, eh, throw and, it away and, and, you know, one, and, yeah. you know, and a 256 gig uh, SD sure. card. And so, you know, we're probably talking 500 bucks. Mm-hmm. You know. Maybe not even, but still, uh, we replaced the BIOS in order mm-hmm. to make all that stuff happen. So it runs C BIOS, uh, SEA BIOS. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I'm like, as I'm doing this, I'm like, okay, I'm having some problems with like shutdown and like you close the laptop and it powers off. Mm-hmm. Like, no, I want that to suspend. And like, there's multi hackery ways to get yes. around it that you close it and you have to have a trigger that runs the shutdown or the the suspend command and all this stuff. And I'm like, but this should be a, like a BIOS feature. How do I update C BIOS? Uh, um, C BIOS uh, is open. Is that an open? I, bl- I, bl- I, bl- I believe, it's, believe that's an open, open source. source. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. But like, recently. how do I update C BIOS for required. this particular version of if the Chromebook? It. Exactly. If they support it, right? That's <sighs> the question. So, like, sometimes these headaches are more are, are, trouble than it's worth, worth it. to just go get a new laptop at a few hundred dollars, right? Yeah. And uh, that yeah. said, um, I, I I bought a, a that shortly thereafter I bought a <clears throat> um, a Lenovo Yoga laptop like a 12 inch super mm-hmm. portable um which one of my cats broke by rubbing up against the uh micro hdmi connector so it won't use an external display anymore um but i got that amazon return scratch and dent for like a half the price and it was super cheap now, for what it was lenovo 
in from what I've learned, yes, recently does a really good job of updating firmware. In fact, they support the LVFS uh, Linux vendor firmware service. They've got over seventeen hundred updates for firmware oh. in that service that you can install on Linux that will update the firmware and your various components on your laptop, provided the vendor, in this case Lenovo, pushes those updates to LVFS. Uh, it's maintained a pro open source project is maintained by a, a gentleman by the name of Richard Hughes uh, to do that. Now, other vendors don't have great support. Some are just like in beta mode, and he lists those all on the website. But Lenovo does a great job of that. Ironically enough, April we saw some updates to Lenovo. Uh, I believe those were UEFI updates um, mm -hmm. for its BIOS. Uh, this month we saw Lenovo. Push uh, so ESET researchers found three different uh, end up being three different CVEs for buffer overflows, memory corruption flaws in UEFI, specifically the DXE drivers in UEFI. Uh, that's a we a whole different rabbit hole for a that's different. Gonna, I was going to say, uh, welcome uh, to Paul's new job in this welcome level to Paul's of nerdery, new job, right? right? Uh, but it was a story this <laughs> week, and it, it made big news because uh, there were three flaws that it affect tens of Lenovo uh, devices. But again, Lenovo's kind of on my list right now. Like I'm developing these like, like, like different levels of how vendors support firmware. Lenovo's pretty high up there as to how much attention they pay to firmware uh, and making sure that that is updated. So they have uh, published uh, patches for, for this release. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll table because I need to do more research on DXE drivers, and I don't want to overstep my bounds, um, but it's a, a component within the UEFI subsystem uh, that will basically, if exploited, gives you control of the machine pre-boot of the kernel uh, on these flaws. Right. So if you have a Lenovo laptop uh, or device, make sure that you're applying uh, these mm -hmm. updates because it's a pretty high risk if an attacker gets into that pre-kernel uh, level subsystem. So make sure you apply these updates. And again, even on Linux, like Lenovo's did a great job of uh, supporting that from what I've yep. gathered so far. Hey, uh, Lee, tell me about your story number five. The Iranian steel facilities. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was almost a throwaway. Because I've got one. Is that, that the fire? Is that the no? Because no. I've got no, no, one, no, I've no, got no, one no. that I think might tie into that a little bit. There was one story <clears> about a fire. Someone caused a fire in Iranian infrastructure. I saw that. I didn't. Maybe, I didn't yeah, know that maybe. story. But, but, but that the, might be the, the tie-in. Kozhestan Steel Company, Iran's primary production facility. The fire there. Yeah. Where that uh, disrupted it, and it had, to, and the, Iran said, "No, it didn't do anything." Um, but uh, yeah, that this was a this was an Interesting one that got me is like, you know, when you talk about revealing what you got and you're going to dump out 20 gigabytes of secret documents or sensitive doc, whatever, right? That's that's a pretty big tip of the hand there. I was kind of that's what caught my attention is like, who the hell dumps that much data uh, without getting some payment? Yeah. Um, but. Uh, yeah, that one was one. I was where did I where did I find that information that I was that really got me going? Um, ah, anyway, so yeah, I just thought it was really interesting that they had they had gotten this huge cache of data. They dropped out twenty gigs. They're claiming to be you know taking over the their their uh, OT stuff there, which I think is actually not completely related. Um, they just got their IT and distracted people with a with an attack. <laughs> Um, interesting is my was my um interpretation thereof yeah i was trying to make sure this wasn't another one of those misconfigured elastic search things that comes up <laughs> uh-huh on those uh, those uh nice uh instances that are uh, ec2 instances or uh, yeah um. <sighs> yeah the disk images that are available and yeah all that stuff and, and Lee, this sort of reminded, and, and the reason why I asked you to, about that one uh, was because of uh, a late-breaking story that I had from earlier today. My story number eight, the uh, report from Barracuda on their state of industrial security in 2022. <clears throat> um, they surveyed 800 senior IT and security officers responsible for uh, 
industrial IoT or IIoT and operational mm-hmm. technology or OT. Uh, and mm-hmm. every one of them uh, had uh, indicated that they had been compromised in some fashion in the last 12 months. I've heard that somewhere else. And uh, I mean, I know that healthcare has been the target the last two years because they've been <laughs> yep. running like hell to get services up and running. Yep. So uh, based and on based on their survey, 93% of the respondents said their uh, organization had failed in their I- IOT and OT security projects. Uh, and that um, 24 to 17% um, of manufacturing and healthcare uh, were identified as being the least prepared industries. <clears throat> yeah. I, and something. Sometimes I wonder if, if as much as anything else is, we had the we had the opportunity because of all kinds of stuff done the last two years. But once people got some traction, do they just go out finding similar stuff that had been there a lot longer and just start tipping it over? Um, I, I mean. I wouldn't be surprised, and, and sort of one of the things that they noted about uh, in that article that I had was uh, the, the geopolitical nature of Russia, Ukraine, and a bunch of others, too, that, you know, there's so much similarities in some of these devices and some of the back ends and some of the software that's running. Like, you know, we talk about Windows being the single most popular, you know, operating desktop operating system in enterprise, and there's reasons why attackers are after these types of things. Similar yeah. types of things are starting to surface in in IoT and IIoT and OT and as well is that there's so many similarities between many of the devices that you just need one attack that will work on one that could work surreptitiously potentially on a whole bunch of others. So for the same reasons why software bill materials starts to become important, know what's on your stuff so that you well, don't get also- your stuff hacked. You know, how many of these organizations aren't capable of keeping things patched and updated? They hired, <laughs> you know, some, some random company to get them going, but then didn't hire anybody to keep it updated or secured. Yep. Because money. It works. Why yeah. do we need to fix it? Like, like, you need to do something to this? Like, it works today and it works tomorrow. What What do you mean we need to do something? Mm. Continue well, care and feeding. I, I was actually pulling the pulling the, the the budget card because I was reading some GAO finding against DOE that was talking about all these things they needed to do, but with no mention of how it was going to be paid for. Uh huh. Um, you know, think about it. You got a fully loaded IT and cyber staff, and you're saying, "Now go do all this stuff. Just 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 get it done." Um, no problem, right? I mean, that work. Te- I mean, technically, yeah. If you think about many of the modern enterprises. Like they they likely have a security group and Paul's getting some more ice for us because more beverages are in order yes. on both rounds. Yes. Uh, you, you talk about the modern security groups and yeah, they've got these folks and they've developed these processes. Some of these IOT and OT organizations, they don't have that same level of commitment and they just did the no. bare necessity to get by. Uh, no, you're talking about the manufacturers that produce uh, IOT in industrial IoT and, devices, and those that are actually using them in the field, and those that are using them, yeah. yeah, yeah, the folks that are. I mean, there've been a lot of talk the last couple of years about you know mandatory standards for IoT or that sort of stuff, and, mm-hmm. and and certifications and stuff. But you know, if you if you don't do the work, it's not going to happen. Not just certifying it, but it's keeping it going. Um, right. Particularly that's, stuff that's, that's my isolated. that's my issue with that, Lee. Is you can certify it at the time it was produced, right. but obviously we talk every week on the show about new vulnerabilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, the most important thing is the continued certification of yes. right. that device. And what is the vendor's commitment to not just Ongoing. firmware, not just operating system, but applications and libraries as well? Because as we all know, right. especially when we talk about supply chain, in other attacks against these devices that if you don't have to go to the firmware level, you attack the application and that gives you complete right. control over the device. Uh, Intezer uncovered um, some pretty serious like Linux malware that I'm still trying to unpack. It uses a shared library. It, it can maintain persistence and do all of those things. 
in mm -hmm. largely leveraging vulnerabilities that exist in the application and mm -hmm. operating, not even down to the kernel, just, you know, I, it, well, some of it is kernel because they're loading shared libraries, right? And there could be kernel mm -hmm. protections that could protect that. Maybe those don't exist in those IoT <laughs> devices. So what's your commitment as a vendor to go, like how, how far are we gonna go? Like what lengths are we gonna go through to protect this device up until what point? Is it two years? Is it three years? Is it five years? My question right. today always is, if it's, if you can leverage open source projects to continue support for that device, what is their commitment to that, right? Like I look at it, if you have an IoT device and you wanna put OpenWRT on it, well, if OpenWRT is keeping up with all these like uh, security advisories, are you in better shape with open source than you are that comes from the manufacturer? Then you get into supply chain, you get into government and um, CMMC and all of those things and verifying the supply chain maybe you can't use open source so how do you maintain the various bill of materials that exist on your device for a certain period of time maybe you can't use open source you got to rely on the vendors and what's their commitment right so and, and then on top of that so you know i've got my i've i've got my my piece of hardware and i'm continuing to get updates but i've got to remember that 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 that, that the components in it are going to start breaking down after a while mm -hmm. and that it's going to stop working and if i haven't got plans to replace it by then it doesn't matter how much i'm updating it the hardware is failing <laughs> right <laughs> been there done that yeah you know i i think something related and i and i want to sort of point this out you know point you paul you talk about like you know what can we do to get some of this stuff changed and so forth um uh, admittedly uh, self-serving as of early this year uh, as in January uh, it was announced that the US Department of Commerce uh, was creating a new Internet of Things advisory board to advise mm -hmm. uh, the Internet of established Internet of Things federal working group um, uh, for a wide range of stakeholders outside the federal government with expertise and relating to the Internet of Things um, and this is apparently all being managed by NIST um so um interestingly enough yeah. i have applied to be on said board absolutely and uh had some pretty good uh, recommendations and uh resume and um i it's now what july and i reached out just about a week ago to see you know where things happened like hey did the board get selected mm -hmm. and like did i not did I just not hear anything because I wasn't selected or what's the deal? And I reached out to the contact that the, everything was submitted to. And the comment was, um, we're still continuing to, uh, receive applications and this, and you know, I read this as this is moving at the speed of government. Mm -hmm. so, yep. So uh, like apparently me asking six months later was too soon <laughs> to right. where this stands. Right. So, um, Arguably, uh, the uh, Internet of Things Advisory Board, uh, I may have been one of the first applicants, and they were apparently very excited about my application. That's good. Nice. So, yeah, because yeah. I, cool. I think it, you know, I think it comes down to how long do you want to support a device? Like, yeah. what's the, and that's a, when we talk, so let's put ICS aside for a moment. Yep. We're going to be talking to yep. Leslie Carhart next week, mm -hmm. and we'll dig into that. Oh, I'm but on that the, on the consumer side, the internet of things what's a reasonable expectation of mm. how long a device would live and how long you should or must right those are two very different words yep uh mm -hmm. maintain updates for that for that system My i mean like how secure can you make a device when it comes to market knowing mm. what we know about yep. Firmware, kernels, operating systems, applications, and libraries. Yep. Moore's law. Mm, like, uh, More, yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. my, my initial knee-jerk reaction is somewhere between three and seven years. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> arguably, we start talking IoT devices specifically. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I think about about IoT is that something going into the consumer market. You're in my home. You're as, a door, I like the door lock as an example. right? Yep. Like, if you think about your doorknobs mm -hmm. in your home, what's oh, a reasonable oh, expectation yeah. for how long that think would about, exist in the home? Think about your doorknobs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. But like a, a non-IoT doorknob could exist for 20, 30 years in a home. 70? 
you think about some of these homes. Like, oh, you think yeah. about some of these these Locks? homes yeah. in areas in which they've been significantly more established. Like I I can think of places I could go in England that maybe these keys that have been in use on some of these doors that are still in use today are three to four hundred years old. So like do yeah. we really want smart technology, aka smart, right? Like mm -hmm. like air quote smart technology. Mm -hmm. I recently and I believe Tyler Robinson actually was using some of these devices. I replaced some of mine mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. non IoT devices. Ripped them out. Uh, Amazon, it's a, the key comes from underneath. Like there's a key, mm -hmm. um, but you have to insert the key underneath, hmm. which makes it super hard to pick the lock, <laughs> right? Because it's just really awkward. It's just an ori orientation. To get a, a to. tension or in a, in a pick, like yep. it, at that angle, right? Um, and there's no Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, so we have nothing on there, and it's just a keypad, um, and it's a really well-built uh, lock. Because mm -hmm. I find some of these IoT door locks, like they're just, they're made really, really cheap. Don't get me if started. If it's not the electronics that are failing, the manufacturer is going to stop providing firmware updates, mm -hmm. and then the components are going to wear out. Then if there's a vulnerability, it's <coughs> not going to get yep. fixed. So and that, and that's like why higher security for me and longevity and have a higher quality lock, like I replaced some of mine with these yep. and I'm, I'm super happy and, with them. And arguably that's where I get to the three to seven years in that mm. – Mm -hmm. Consumer gear is significantly cheaper and that I would hesitate. I, I, there would be less hesitation for me to go and replace between $150 and $300 worth of Wi-Fi access points sure. in my home, for example, as opposed to having to deploy $1.2 million worth of Wi-Fi access points in my enterprise. Right. Like, there's a there's a bu budget of scale, you know, scale of budget somewhere in there. And like, you know, three, you know, 150 to 300 dollars every three to five years, three to seven years for me is perfectly reasonable for me to replace the access point to get new, better technology. And as a result, something that's better supported, less vulnerabilities. Right. What and we're so taking forth. Is, is these things in our home, let's mm -hmm. say, that traditionally could have existed for, think about your doorbell. Hardwired yep. into a speaker inside your house. I mean, doorbells. Not a ring, a doorbell. A doorbell, mm -hmm. right? Forty. It's like forty-eight volts or something like that, yep. right? That makes the tone. Twenty. Twenty-four. Is it twenty-four volts? It's twenty-four. Twenty-four yes. volts. <clears throat> um, twenty-four. That can exist in your DC. home for like, I, I mean, doorbells fifty years, a hundred years, whatever. Yeah. yeah. But now, like, how if you bought an original ring, and I don't know the answer to this <clears> question. <throat> um, I think I had one of the original rings. How long are they going to support firmware updates on the original product? Is uh, it ar ring? Arguably, you've, if you had one of the original ring, you were an early adopter. Yeah. And you went and said, oh, well, this shit's five years old. There's better now. I'm going to go buy the new better one. Mm. So, like, there's a little bit of difference there between a doorbell that works and has worked forever as opposed to somebody adopting new technology and is continuing to adopt new technology in a three to seven year lifespan. Mm. Especially if the devices are reasonably priced because IoT and, and, and so forth. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, but the original rings are pretty expensive. A few hundred dollars for a yep. doorbell. Yep. But you're right. That there is better. So is there a, a replacement? Pro like if I have an account with Ring, can I go, I want an update, an upgrade? And instead of two hundred dollars, it's a hundred bucks. There might be, right now. I don't want them to take my. It cost them money for me to right, send the, them back. They, they don't want the device. They don't want it. Like they're, recycle they're, that device. Yep, with recycle your, it. Uh, yeah, and just Heck, send me a new continue one. to use it. But you're not going to get any more support. Like that's their thing. Yeah. Like, but that then you're yeah. not getting the security updates, and that worries me. Right. But people may still use it. Oh, we'll put it out on the you know out on the back shed, or we'll send it over to the vacation property. Like, oh, we've right. got a second it's one vulnerable. now. <laughs> yep. And that's bad. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about lockdown mode on Apple. Did you guys read oh. this story? I, di I, I, heard, I, yeah. I skimmed a little bit of it, and I think it was kind of fascinating. It sounds like this is in direct response to Pegasus. It Agreed. is exactly that. Exactly. Right? I mean, you, you can't, there's no mincing words about it. This is in direct response to Pegasus. Uh, Apple uh, makes the most secure devices on them, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, right? But so the, the thing that, that, like, Apple's head of security, engineering, and architecture, Yvonne Christic, um, 
While the vast majority of users will never be the victims of highly targeted cyber mm -hmm. attacks, we will work tirelessly to protect the small number of users who are. And you, scro and you Dude. scroll down to the very end. There is now undeniable evidence from the research of the Citizens Lab, Citizen Lab, and their other organizations and they that the mercenary surveillance industry is facilitating the spread of authori authoritarian practices and massive human rights abuses worldwide. And the Citizen Group applauds Citizens Apple's e effort, yep. effort for establishing this important. Uh, security. Oh. So lockdown mode, uh, yeah. you can turn it on. I mean, this almost makes me want to go get an Apple phone because they have this lockdown mode. I'm like, this is actually really cool. So message attachment types other than images are blocked. Yep. Um, yep. Link previews are disabled. Uh, just in so time forth. JavaScript compilation are disabled unless the user excludes a trusted site from lockdown mode. Uh, incoming invitations and service requests, including FaceTime calls, are blocked. Wired connections with a computer or accessory are blocked when the <coughs> iPhone is locked, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Uh, configuration mm -hmm. profiles cannot be installed, and the devices cannot enroll into MDM. While, lock right. mode, While no. lockdown mode is turned on. That's an interesting right. one. Mm. That's an interesting one. So you can't change the management of the device while it's locked down. Yep. And the one thing that I think is also fascinating is uh, Apple has uh, will uh, update their bug bounty program to, uh, to, to, to double uh, anything for qualifying findings if you can break, in lockdown mode. So bounties are doubled for qualifying findings in lockdown mode up to a maximum of $2, $2 million, million dollars, the highest maximum bounty payout in the industry. Not even for Apple, but $2 million is the... I want to ver... I mean, is that really true? I mean... Mm -hmm. We know the people that run the bug, but like two million dollars, mm -hmm. they're saying is the highest maximum bounty payout in the industry. I would, yeah, I think I think they had the previous at one million, mm. so now they're at double. Yeah. Uh, they're then also they got, go ahead, Lee. Yeah, I was gonna say I think you're gonna say what? what go ahead. I know you're saying what I was about to say about the ten dollar, ten million dollar grant. Yep. Plus any damages awarded to Apple from the lawsuit filed against the NSO group, Pegasus. Like there's also there's still rumors that a U.S. military <laughs> contractor is still in the hunt to purchase NSO Group. I wouldn't be surprised. I still saw stories this week. About I wouldn't. That. I wouldn't be surprised. Like you think about uh, what is it? Uh, this is how they tell me the world ends. Mm -hmm. Like that was the ending of that. Like people are trying to buy the NSO Group, right? And it's government military contractors. As, so much, I, as much as many of us may have hated that book, there was still some very much elements of truth in that. Right. <clears throat> um, let's see. Do we? I want to go back to firmware for a moment. <laughs> of course, you um, sure. Because I wanted. To, well, I, there was a, another <laughs> Lenovo story that I thought was interesting. That uh, many may, it may not have come across like on your feeds because it was a, a Twitter post by someone named Matthew Garrett mm. who uncovered that. In Lenovo's documentation, that laptops being shipped with secure cord PCs by default now will not trust Microsoft's third party CA by default. Hmm. So you have to go into the BIOS and disable it. Uh, enable it, rather. So That's weird. What this means is like this delves into the rabbit hole of secure boot, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in uh, secure boot is based on. Um, certificates that are signed by Microsoft. And there's a, a key architecture in Secure Boot. So there's four primary items in, in Secure Boot that when I explain them, this whole thing will make sense. Um, so there's the platform key or the PK, right? Which is the highest level of trust in mm -hmm. the Secure Boot process. That's typically a key that is signed by, I believe that one is also signed by Microsoft, by the hardware vendor and serves as the platform key. The platform key then signs the key exchange key. The key exchange key can then mm -hmm. sign binaries that are part of the secure boot process. And then, and then uh, the key exchange key signs two different databases, the DB and the DBX. So the DB is our um, hashes and certificates of binaries that are authorized mm -hmm. in the secure boot process. The DBX is a revocation list of binaries uh -huh. that are not allowed okay. in the secure boot process and have been revoked. So with Microsoft, like it's all in Microsoft. So yeah. Microsoft controls the, the CA, you boot Microsoft Windows, 
secure boots enabled, that level mm -hmm. of trust from the PK to the KEK to the uh, DB and DBX uh, are all signed. So you want me to sign, you want me yeah. to trust your keck? Correct. That's what you're saying. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. Well, more Sorry. importantly, oh. trust my software that's signed by the CAC. Right, um, right, right. So if you're not Microsoft, you can submit an application for your software to be signed by Microsoft by Microsoft for this process. Microsoft deems that as the third party mm -hmm. CA. So, for example, Linux, if I want to boot Linux in secure boot mode, my Linux distribution has to create software, submit that software to Microsoft, and go, hey, Microsoft sign this software and in, in, in be part of the key exchange so that this software is trusted in the secure boot process. So what uh, Linux distributions did was rather than getting all of the bootloaders like Grub uh, and the kernel uh, to be uh, signed individually, so like every Linux distribution would have to have every kernel and every version, every version of Grub <laughs> like all signed by Microsoft, they created this project called shim shim is a small bootloader oh, that's signed by microsoft's third-party ca that can now load every other that can yeah. that then the kek is now controlled by the distribution so the shim is signed and can load grub and can load the kernel it's a, and it's get a shim to go between the signed Correct. portion of the bootloader Correct. to whatever bootloader and it's in the that. chain of trust as it were right there's other nuances there, like a machine owner key, which gets into that's a whole yeah. different segment so, so, in and of itself. But so Lenovo removed Microsoft's third-party CA. Third-party CA by default. So what Lenovo oh. said was, like, if it's not Microsoft Windows and it's a third-party, uh, a third-party, like the third-party component of that CA, mm -hmm. like you have to go turn that feature on by default. So the BIOS trusts. Binary signed by Microsoft's third party CA. So, in other I mean, words, this if you want to use right. Linux and you have Shim that's it's trusted, not a, it's not a bad thing. But, it, like, there's no security benefit to doing that because that chain of trust already exists. Microsoft verifies the integrity of the code being signed by Microsoft's third party no, CA. So no, can, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Well, well, I mean, so there's a, and I, and I see the reason for this. If they remove, they turn off the third party by default, that means no one can. Get onto your machine, update your bootloader to include shim, which could then do whatever. It could move into booting Windows. It could move into booting Linux. It could move like Grub would do. So by effectively removing the ability by default to have something like shim work, they've removed all of that threat about being able to put something in between the bootloader and Windows. Yeah, but the the shim is the the bootloader that's signed in the right. So they've right. removed they've removed the ability to have shim. You got to have a Microsoft bootloader. You have to have right. They right. they basically said like we only trust Microsoft. We don't trust any of the third party right kind of right. stuff. So mm -hmm. like you can't trust shim. So you couldn't do anything else. I think a lot of it is so they don't have to deal with the revocation list if mm. there's a vulnerability in shim or any of the other Linux distributions have signed other bootloaders like Grub or other kernels mm -hmm. in the revocation. They don't have to deal with the revocation list if there's a vulnerability in them. If it's disabled by sure. default, it's on the user to kind of go in and disable that yeah. and enable that whole train of trust yeah. is, and, and, is kind of my thinking. And same sort of thing with Shim too. Like it's now <laughs> in the user's responsibility to allow Shim, which could allow for other attacks at that level. If it's disabled by default, right. correct. If it's yep. enabled right. by default, it's up to Linux distributions to maintain that trust and also update the distribution list. Mm -hmm. in, that. in other words, the Linux distributions would somehow have to submit to the revocate because like the db and the dbx are signed by the kek so like I, as a user like i or an attacker i can't just go and say like oh this new bootloader from me evil attacker is in the allow list like no because mm. that allow list has to be signed by by a key that's yeah. issued from uh, uh, the ca like it's in that in that chain of trust on the congress yeah. i'd love to have figure out what the mechanism for updating that uh, the revocation list is. Oh my god, that's my world yeah. right now, dude. <laughs> it's my world how, how right now. It? And yeah. that, but that's it's, the that's that's the sticking point in it. Um, it's an interesting teaser, Lee. Your question into my my latest post of how do you check? How do you know if you have the latest revocation, revocation list? list? Whose responsibility is it to update that revocation list? It's up to 
whoever's the holder of the KEK <laughs> that has mm -hmm. provided that DBX, that is the DBX is signed by the KEK to provide updates to that. Is it the hardware manufacturer? Is it the OS? Is it the the, yeah. the shim bootloader owner? Like who's and, and and at what point during the boot process does it get updated? And yeah. how often? And what networks do you need to be connected to? And where are you reaching out to to update it? Yeah, it, exactly. The, the signing how process. Big is it? Yeah, the signing. Thirty two k. How big is the CAC? Thirty two k. Actually, funny you should ask. There so is a, you, so you, so. Ooh. What you're saying is you have a pretty small CAC. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, and that's some of the concern in in why there's some uh, debate as to how this list should be mm. updated. So, like, as researchers find vulnerabilities in things like bootloaders. That means there needs to be updates to the DBX, mm. but the DBX is 32 kilobytes. Yeah. And so like that list of, so it can be hash, hashes of binaries or certificates that can be in the revocation list. Mm -hmm. It can't grow to a certain amount. And, and how do you manage that? And whose <coughs> job it, it is to yeah. manage that becomes question. As a user, how do you know if it's out of date or not? Yep. I would highly recommend oh. Eclipsium's product yeah. to do that because that's what I use. But I also show open source methods to be able to do that. But like knowing if you're out of date or not is a huge problem. Uh, uh, right? Lee, As Lee, is well, Lee, Lee's got a, Lee's got a comment and then I want to chime in with something here. So so what I was gonna say, there's 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 two things. Krills do have expiration dates. And what happens if it's out if, if it's expired and you haven't got the new one? Do you fail open or close? Ooh. Typically, you fail cl in secure boot. Typically, you fail closed, right? You're either allowed or you're not. If you're not allowed, your system will not boot and you'll get to a screen. Now, majority of the time, not all of the time, because uh, I never want to say that. Majority of the time, you can go into your BIOS UEFI and uh, disable secure boot. And, and get into your system and mm -hmm. then go fix stuff, right? Like you're not, but right, I mean like, right, right. I don't want to say that's 100% of the time because there are scenarios like if you've set a BIOS password and you forget your BIOS password and you've got secure boot enabled and something in the revocation list and it, it fails and you can't get in your BIOS to disable it, mm -hmm. you're locked out of your system. Like now you're soldering shit onto the board mm -hmm. or whatever. Like it's, yep. it's a bad yep. day. Like you could break your system. Yep. So all of this, you have to be careful. Like use at your own risk. There's a disclaimer on my post that's coming out that's like, use all the stuff at your own risk. Like this, this is not, uh, yep. you know, for mm -hmm. the faint of heart kind of thing. You can also do this on Windows too. Microsoft provides a facility. There's some PowerShell scripts and other things that you can update your uh, DBX or revocation list. You got to make sure that when you do that, that whatever KEK you have has signed, it, it is authorized to uh, read that DBX. So yeah. the other scenario is you can roll your own keys. So you can generate your own PK your own KEK and use it to sign your own DB and, and DBX. But in that case, like you're on your own <laughs> after that. Like if there's updates to let's say a kernel module and it's not signed by your custom rolled KEK, your, it is not, yep. it, your system's not gonna boot. You <coughs> have to go sign your kernel and or that module um, with your own KEK to do that. To me, that was like way too much maintenance, right? Like Canonical and other Linux distributions have gotten on the secure boot uh, kind of train yep. uh, and done that for you. So, I mean, that's my post that, that's coming out. We'll talk about some of that uh, secure boot and stuff specific to the, the revocation list. So to tie, to tie this back to something, you know, mm -hmm. you know self-referential and for me, um, in the, the wireless class X617, you know, Lee's experienced this. Uh, we went through a Zigbee module and as part of the class, Right up front, we tell you, hey, we're going to learn about some pretty obscure stuff and maybe some stuff that's old that's going to teach you about stuff that you can use as you move forward in your career that might not be wireless related. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we talk about is uh, uh, Zigbee and Zigbee profiles. Uh, one And you know, yeah. my experience there is around um, one of the Zigbee profiles for a secure energy protocol. Uh, and an updated version uh, SCP-2 uh, for that security protocol includes the ability to do some um, encryption using TLS. But their version of TLS has no capacity to have a certificate revocation list. Mm. So we're talking about certificate revocation lists and the sizes and like, this is better than Zigbee SCP-2.0. 
Yeah, I mean the whole thing. The, with, the things you're learning from wireless can apply to other stuff, right? Um, so yeah. I, 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 I adjusted my podcast listening uh, playlist uh, this week. So I dumped, I dumped some old ones that I wasn't listening to. Mm-hmm. I loaded a bunch of new ones, unsubscribed mm-hmm. from the ones I wasn't really I- impressed with, and I won't say yep. who any of those are, right? Um, but one that that caught my attention that I was listening to that talks about this this exact topic, whether it's using uh, certificates Mm -hmm. uh, with actual signing or it's a signature or a checksum, right? Like we, uh, so there's two different ways to do that, right? Actual signing or just a checksum. Like I download a tarball and or binary, it comes associated with that, some type of SHA-256 checksum that says, yes, that's the, the software I intended it to be and it's a signature. But if the attacker controls both the software and the ability to generate a new signature, you know, that's kind of out the window. Yeah. So I was listening to the Open Source Security Podcast. Oh, episode yeah. 329 is called Signing What Is It Good For? And given my research on Secure good Boot God, that I've been doing, right? And secure Boot, I was like, oh, I want to listen to this issue. Mm-hmm. And they were talking about all these issues um, related to that. I thought it was a great episode that, and worth that's, listening yeah. to. That podcast has been around for a really long time, hasn't it? Episode 329, so they're 329 episodes in. Because, like, I want to say I remember talking about them quite some time ago. And they may not have the same release frequency as we do. Sure, sure. But I remember, I seem to remember talking about that for a a while. Yeah. Um, Also, there was um, one that I, oh, man, I got to go back and and listen to because it was, they talked about Hearts Bleed and the person what was her name that was on that podcast Mm. holy crap she knew encryption stuff and encryption protocols like i had never uh security cryptography whatever is the name of the podcast and i don't i don't recall their name because it doesn't tell me who the people are when i look at my spotify but it's called Security Cryptography and whatever. Thomas Tachek is one of the hosts on this one. He actually wasn't on this episode, but they did, they did an episode on Hearts Bleed. Totally amazing. Totally. I mean, mm-hmm. she was talking about in, encryption technologies and standards at a level that I was super, like, way over my head. I was like, I, I need to, I can't listen to this in the car. Like, I got to go listen to this in my office and, like, really pay attention to it. Um, so I was super impressed with that podcast as well. So maybe we'll include some podcast reviews yeah. uh, as, as part of the show because I'm one of the statistics that I think is really interesting to note. Pre-pandemic, there were about five hundred thousand podcasts Good available. God. After pandemic, post-pandemic, two point two million. Wow. Yeah. So like everyone was at home and like, oh, I'm going to record a podcast kind of thing. So hey, there's we've been a there. ton, right? <laughs> ton, ton of new podcasts out there, and I, I was just doing some. Nice. Uh, exploring so it's interesting there's so many podcasts that i could actually find one and find an episode that was related to the research that i was doing for my mm. day job exactly i was like wow that's the, the crazy part is is that i haven't listened to a podcast in a really long time mm-hmm. even though i've been on one for a really long time right um i've chosen to consume via other media such as youtube mm-hmm. and uh, audiobooks like i don't i used to have like satellite radio and yeah. all this stuff in the car i'm like no i Audiobooks, and we have different audiobooks depending on who's in the car. What's like, your cybersecurity nice. audiobook that you're digging now? Oh, so I've because ju- you're on the Canon review I uh, I, board. I, yeah. I actually jumped out of uh, the cybersecurity review stuff or the cybersecurity podcast or books for a little bit just to get a little bit of a break. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the last couple that I listened to. Um, the last two specifically uh, was one uh, the, the the one that got a bunch of negative comments. The how Nicole this is, Perot, this the, is how the, the world the, ends. The world yep. ends, and I wouldn't say it's bad. There's some there's some good stuff. In I there. wouldn't say it's good, but it really it it was informational and it included me into a bunch of things that I had not right. been previously exposed to. So I I've expressed on the show I did not like how she portrayed the security industry initially I thought it was initially, yeah, initially initially it was crap mm-hmm. and as it went on it, it got, got better, better. It got a there better, were still yeah. a lot <laughs> of crap comments about some of the stuff and and but like she's, you know, and she and she's not wrong because i think that she felt that 
because and I would not dispute this at all because she was a woman in that industry she got shunned a lot mm. yeah and, and I, I mean and, and that I, I can know. I can see that we'll move on from that uh, that was one of the last ones and the other one was ah oh, crap let me look this one up uh, real quick uh, because it was awesome it was awesome and um, I felt um, interesting about reading it in that I'm going to provide a review and as soon as I find it um, the review becomes kind of uh, interesting uh, let me see here. Where is it? Uh, cybersecurity career path. Na sorry, navigating the cybersecurity career path. Insider advice mm. for navigating your first gig to the C-suite. Wow. And I thought it was effing fantastic. That's a long title. It was. And it was written by Helen Patton, who is, uh, was advisory, uh, mm. CISO, sounds familiar. advisory CISO, uh, at Cisco and is yeah. now, uh, CISO, I think at Duo. Yes. Uh, and she was also familiar. the head of the <laughs> cyber cannon community uh, security board oh, okay. at the time when I yes. read it. So she was the leader of mm. the cybersecurity cannon when I read it. But she is no longer. She is, uh, you know, we've, we've changed roles in, in, in some of those as, as those things do. But um, it was an amazing, amazing book. And for those who are looking to break into the industry, who are in the industry, who are looking to advance and to move up. Uh, whether or not you move into management or not, this was a fantastic book and fantastic pieces of advice. Mm -hmm. Go read it, like now. Not, awesome. a, not a terribly long read, not a terribly you know in-depth, like, oh my God, this is hurting my brain. But to me, this was the cybersecurity equivalent of Every Tool is a Hammer by Adam Savage for the Maker Crowd. Mm-hmm. Use the right tool for the right job. This was it. Mm. Awesome. So some of the awesome. other ones that are in my uh, recent risk, uh, recent list that are cybersecurity related is, uh, or so forth, the spy in Moscow station, uh, a counter spy's hunt for a deadly Cold War threat, fatal system error, mm. the hunt for new crime lords who are bringing down the internet by Joseph Men. Mm-hmm. Um, Worm, the first digital world war by Mark Bowden. Mm. And I read that one. That was um, there's a couple of other ones that are not necessarily related. Um, I'm I'm taking a break uh, and moving into some of the uh, um, uh, the uh, oh what is it? There's a genre that. Uh, post-apocalyptic fiction uh, with geo with geostorm and um, uh, a bunch of other type of stuff as well. Did you read uh, All Systems Red? Uh, it's on my list. Okay, I was going to say uh, uh, All Systems one. Red by Martha Wells. Martha Wells, that's the author. Thank you. Yep, she's amazing. The author in science fiction. I read that. There's a whole nice. series. I got to get back to the series, but that All Systems Red was amazing. Adrian's a big yeah. fan of that as well. Yep. Uh, Confessions of a CIA Spy, Project Hail Mary by Peter Andy Peter Wonka is Confessions of a CIA mm -hmm. Spy. We yep. interviewed him on the show. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is Zoro Rat Hijack Soho Routers. Did you guys read this? I did not read this one. Pretty yep. sophisticated uh, piece of malware that gets on a uh, Soho kind of router type device, does a lot of dns hijacking it, it's funny larry i was reading the what this particular piece of uh, malware does and thinking back to our presentations in the 2008 ish time frame after we wrote the book and we theorized about how we could write malware how malware would operate in the iot router kind of environment in all of the things that we theorized about have come true today and really come to fruition Damn in um, what, who did this research? Um, Black Lotus Labs. Oh. Yeah, Lumen, Lumen's uh, Black Lotus Labs found this particular malware, reverse engineered it, 
Um, and basically it was intercepting um, in, in redirecting people because they were taking over the uh, IoT device or Soho router and mm -hmm. um, hijacking HTTP and DNS uh, requests hmm. as well as other things. Then they got on the, the Windows thing. I think this is the one that was enumerating the network. It had a lot of network yeah, enumeration. It is. it is. Was that this one or was that a different one? I think I had two I've different stories on this one. Got enumeration listed here. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, definitely worth a read. Um, and and some pretty sophisticated uh, again things that we theorized about many years ago, like coming to fruition today, like being able to hide on this device because you can live in memory if it's rebooted, you, it removes everything. Be live on this device even if it's persistent because who's going to do forensics on that device get on this device because it controls all of the traffic that is going in it had a very sophisticated mechanism for uh intercepting traffic and then redirecting traffic all of the things we theorized about larry um get kind of came to fruition uh the one that link the lumen blog post is the best one for this one that is my story nice Number 10. My story number 10 is a great read. Agreed. And I was trying to think that basically the only way to fix this one is to like factory reset your router if it's got it. Am I, think, am I remembering that right? Yeah, but factory reset, but then you get a patch and or mitigate the vulnerability they got in initially. Right. I don't know if that was right. a... If it's yeah. Mirai, like it's probably some kind of default or easily guessable username yep, and password. That's back to the traditional, res you know, IR responses. Yeah. Is you got to fix. You can reboot and you can you go to backup for for all you want, but you got to figure out what the the root cause was so you can fix that before you go back to production again. Right. Yeah. yeah. Turn not off not remote administration. Yeah. Not only do you need to reset to factory defaults, you need to update. ASA yeah. freaking P before yeah. it gets hacked again. Yeah, because yeah. I think a lot of times factory reset, if I remember correctly, Larry, resets the file system. Mm -hmm. Right? Like mm -hmm. the, because the, the file, the, there's no. NVRAM. NV, well, NVRAM is the variables, but then also the, the file system. Like that factory, or even firmware flashing more specifically would rewrite the file. Because the file system's a part of that firmware. Right. And if, right. if it's, even if it, the malware lives on the file system. You can rewrite and recreate that comp usually compressed file system right. on those devices right. in firmware. Yep. But again, you, you got to fix the vulnerability. You're going to get reinfected. Mm -hmm. yep. A one that really hurts hey. my brain that I think we probably need to bring on some folks to talk about. Um, in the future, it deals with a, a new speculative execution oh, attack uh, called Replead that's kind of building upon um, Spectrum Meltdown. So Replead aims to hijack a return instruction in the kernel. It's all speculation, if you ask me. To gain arbitrary speculative code execution in the kernel context, sufficient control over registers and or memory at the victim return instruction, the attacker can leak arbitrary kernel data. So basically, in a nutshell, the return instructions uh, as an attack vector for speculative execution and force the returns to be predicted. So this is some of the protections they put in or basically the return trampoline being somewhat um, defined at runtime to protect that uh, prediction of, of where it's going to return to. They define these return pointers at runtime to, pr to protect yep. that, but uh, Replead somehow finds a way around that. It's kind of what I gleaned. Uh, from this again, Kinda super cool. super technical, very cool, but super super technical, uh, in affecting both AMD and uh, Intel CPUs. What's interesting is uh, there are certain protections in place that Windows operating systems use by default, so no update is required. And um, Intel said in advisory, it is working with the Linux community to make available software updates uh, for the shortcoming. Need. Lee, any other stories you want to hit? Oh, I was just, I was just <laughs> down in the weeds of that story looking at what they're doing. Oh, to, the weeds uh, go deep in that one, Lee. <laughs> yes. it's like, you should, oh, so I, you've I seen actually, my garden, right? Yep. I did, I did actually troll Paul with my number six story. Oh, oh. Uh, 
Oh. The, 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 once again, a NASA attack. <laughs> Shocking these people are going back to the nap. We were talking about that in a meeting earlier today, Lee. Oh. Yeah, we were. And um, I'm like, don't buy QNAP. I mean, I'm sorry. They're they're like they got like a target on them or something. They just always going after them. And people always, well, I, I got to be careful. There's so many cool functions in NAS devices that would be are really awesome to make internet accessible that you do, and that's how people are getting in there and, yeah. and doing their thing. Um, you know what's interesting the, is that um, we've QNAP has a lot of security vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And my experiences with Drobo, I've had two catastrophic failures. One was like a, the first one was really like kind of an out of the blue, just catastrophic failure. And it was interesting. It's like one of those things where we say like there was an uh, incident in Texas with an ICS uh, facility. And they were like, well, we don't think it's hackers. <laughs> and they're like, well, how do you know that? Like, how deep did you go in the forensic? We'll talk some of this, mm. you know, about some of this with Leslie next week. Like, how do you know? And so uh, my first Drobo failure, I was like, was this a malicious attacker? Yeah, how do you know either, it's hackers? But either like external malicious attacker mm -hmm. or was it a malicious insider? Or was it an insider that wasn't necessarily malicious, but like <clears throat> unintended consequences uh -huh. caused this failure? Or was it just a failure in the hardware and or software in the Drobo device. Now, what mm. we concluded, and I worked with Tyler very, very closely on the first incident with our Drobo, Tyler and I concluded that it was just a hardware and or software failure that led to this loss of data. Yep. So we rebuilt right. everything. Rebuilt the device, started from scratch. Then that device required a firmware update. And I was like, oh, Ooh. given previous experiences, like I should probably keep up to date with this. It has mm -hmm. vulnerabilities. <clears throat> Let me apply the firmware update. The application of the firmware update triggered a bug oh. that, again, catastrophic failure. The catastrophic <coughs> failure caused, like, soldering to the board, taking the entire thing apart, at which time I was like, you know what? I think we should just get a whole new NAS system. Yep. And we're, then we're, we're, done like, with, we're done with Drobo, right? We're done with Drobo. So those two instances, like, I'm, I, I hate to knock, you know, manufacturers or vendors of any kind on this show. Because we get the struggle, it gets hard, mm -hmm. you know, you're pr producing a product and bringing it to market and supporting it. But I'm like, my experience is like, I'm, I'm done with drove. Second time, like, it's not even three strikes, you're out, like two, two strikes, strikes, you're yeah, out. Two critical failures, yeah. yeah. So, so then I'm like, well, we need some other kind of NAS. And Lee and I were talking briefly today about QNAP and how there's so many different vulnerabilities mm -hmm. in QNAP. Like that, like Drobo failures, QNAP Vulnerability. Severe vulnerability. So, like, what's the next? Free NAS, right? Yeah. Free, uh, so, we talked about that. <laughs> like, we're like, you know what? Uh, like, our options now are roll our own, essentially, or mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. open source software to build our own yep. network attack storage device, or was it Synology? Synology was the okay, other right, vendor, with it, which, like, we haven't tried QNet, but we know from covering the show, yep. as Lee points out in his story number six. Like yet more vulnerabilities, right? Drobo for reliability is is out of the picture right mm -hmm. now. So and I I had a oh what was my NAS? Was it a net? No, it wasn't Netgear. I had some other NAS that was like a PowerPC mm, based yeah. chip. It was really old. It wasn't Netgear. I can't remember who the vendor was. And that thing <clears throat> that thing died too. That, and that's where I'm at now. Is that my current backup solution is not NAS based. Mm. It's yeah. network attached storage that is garbage. Yeah. And to the point that like it's becoming unusable for me to do the backups that I've mm -hmm. resorted to local USB backups. Sure. And those you and I have had USB local USB backup failures that I need to do something. That's why I'm interested yeah. in this conversation. Right. Like Yeah, I'm like our use case in the studio is like we need to share very large media files between right. computers <clears throat> now, right? Because like it's hard to separate the computers that record what we're doing on the yep. podcast from the ones that are editing. Because, like, if you're editing, on, we do so many shows now, basically, that it's not feasible to be editing on the same computer that is doing the recording. Right. Like, and we've you, got really cool processes for, and you need to be like, sure. as we do the show, stuff is getting recorded to, like, a really super fast computer, and that's cool. And you need to be able to share this in super near real-time fast Correct, because right. I want to bring that data from 
the recording machine off to an editing machine mm-hmm. so that we can do the next recording yep. and while be the editing, editing is the previous one on, while the editing is happening. Like you, yep. you, you, just, you need multiple machines. How do you get that data from point A to point B as quickly as, as possible? Like I think it's yep. kind of silly to go out to the internet and back <laughs> to do that because also like oh, yeah. we're streaming and broadcasting Amazon as, 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 or yeah, any of that type or of stuff Amazon or S3 or S3, S3 is three, great yep. but that's not really like we need a local way to like just pump that data to a new yep. system yep. look if, if you were if you were doing a bunch of doc, document shared documenting editing and maybe some lim- some images and I'm not talking big things the, the internet word use case would be fine, and for a lot of people right. that can be, but for sharing yeah, for big backup, ass files that you right. got to manipulate and edit, no freaking way right. you can. The data is moving. No. To your point, Lee, the data is moving in our case. A backup solution, the data doesn't really need to be moving that. It needs to be moving mm-hmm. from this is what I've stored, and now I want to back it up. And like maybe someday I want to go back and, and, and retrieve that data, mm-hmm. right? In our case, it's like. I got data that's freshly stored here, and I want to immediately take that and move it somewhere else so that someone else can do something with that data. Yeah. Right? It, Different it, use cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and for, for my case, was very much uh, media-related. I had a bunch of media stored on a local USB disk and was being backed up maybe once a month to a remote network disk. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I perform some operations to do some file renames because of stupidity on the local disk Mm -hmm. and it was right before the backup happened and Uh the backup happened and then I realized that there was massive changes that caused me to lose a bunch of media data that required two years worth of recovery from my backup service to happen you know, one thing I'm thinking, because, like, like, could you, if it was all, I mean, Linux, it doesn't even need to be Linux in this mm. case, but you could just R-sync that data. That's right? what I was like, doing. Yeah. Like, uh, the, the problem as is soon is as it lands on the disk, the recording's done, friggin' just R-sync kick off it. a job, R-sync it to a different computer, even directly, <laughs> like, R-sync it directly to that other computer and, that and went, be done. That, and that was my problem, was that I did this file operation. Cool. It worked. The next day, R-sync happened. Then the next day, I went... Oh shit! Mm. It's all broken. I've lost thirty gigs worth of data. Garbage in, garbage out. Yep, basically. exactly. Yeah, and yeah, the, the, yeah. because of the R sync, there was no, there was no turning back. Right. You were doing R sync with the delete option, weren't you? Yep. Yeah, mm. I've done that. <laughs> so many lessons learned on that. Right. And uh, yeah, it took it took me a full two years to recover the media that I had lost. Ugh. Yep. Yeah, I've just had with network attached storage so many vulnerabilities, so many catastrophic failures that I just it needs to be more robust. Like mm-hmm. you don't want to cheap out on that stuff. Basically, no. I no. do agree that like USB devices are really if you don't need to move it to a different computer necessarily in any expedient fashion uh, in a process that you know data lands on a disk and you dump that off to a usb to do backups and stuff that's the way to go because mm-hmm. usb is super fast and you get usbs with nvme in them and in solid state they're just super fast mm-hmm. you can run whole vms on them even encrypted it's awesome yep yep i get some i get some home upgrades to do uh, the the last home upgrade was UPSs because mm. I had been running ten year old UPSs and some of them were starting to fail and yep yep I had to do that and that stuff's costly <clears throat> like you think about it's costly to just like go buy them and have enough capacity mm-hmm. but you think about the cost of a catastrophic failure from power and it's way high so I redid yep. my home office right in my night before my first day at Eclipsium. I had like outfitted my whole office, moved mm-hmm. all my computer gear into like this all like consolidated everything because I had like you know computers and monitors and different. Yeah. Locations. I had like three different offices consolidated into one, and I, I just I hadn't put UPSs uh, in all the <sighs> right places. And the night before, dude, there was a lightning storm. No. Now, luckily, Uh-oh. luckily everything was fine, but still, I got up that 
morning really early and i was like holy crap there's no i, I bought ups's to protect all of my gear because mm -hmm. i you know audio gear computer yeah. gear in there and i'm like nope this is getting all protected by ups's yep yep, mm -hmm. yep. so i spend a, a few hundred dollars five hundred dollars but the, that's the, a that's it's it's, it's insurance it, at that point exactly the, well actually go ahead lee I was going to say I found I was I was I've got a couple areas where I've got like a little switch or a little device that you know it's just all by itself and I don't want to spend a lot of money on a, on a UPS. They actually have these like little twelve five and twelve yeah. volt UPSs that are isn't that cool? Tiny. Like, yeah, like like single outlet little battery yeah. backups, right? Yeah, uh, APC right. makes and it. I just yeah, Schneider Electric strap now, it yeah. to the side, replace the power strip with that. I'm mean, the power supply with that and and. It gives me, you know, an hour or whatever because the draw is low. And you, most outages are less than that. So I right. was like clicking along, no problem. <clears throat> for, you know, less than $30, I'm done. Yeah, you're not looking for long, long term is like, you know, Larry, what you have, uh, you know, at your <laughs> two, house, right? Two Tesla Gen power Generator walls or, or solar yep. with, with Tesla power walls or yep. your long term kind of stuff. Yeah. And and we uh, it's funny, we've switched to the power walls twice since they've been installed and even in not efficient status and... Like, honestly, the first time it switched, we didn't even notice. Yep. Like, I, got, the way to be. I got the notification on my phone that the Tesla Powerwall said, hey, you've there's been an out. Uh, no, sorry. I got a notice from Verizon saying that the power was out. Mm -hmm. And then a notice from the Powerwall saying, hey, you've switched to battery backup. And I go outside and look up, like, everybody's dark and we're not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. It's amazing. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and it's funny when I designed the uh, UPS battery backup for my home stuff. I didn't have the Tesla power walls, and I had significantly more systems online than I do now. So, how do I disable the beeping? Because <laughs> mm. it will stay up for probably a full day with the current load, as opposed to the load mm -hmm. that I've got on it, that right. had on it initially. So. Lee, yeah. you had uh, the open SSL uh, flaw as your story Ooh. number four. I, four. I oh, don't yeah. think we, we talked about that last week. Mm. Did we? I don't think I don't. this is a, a heap overflow in the right. uh, open SSL library um, affecting right. 3.04, which is interesting because right. I, I checked some of my Ubuntu systems and I'm still 1.12. <laughs> <1. Yeah. 12. laughs> Is the one in there? Because I was concerned. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Um, I also heard that I was listening to like Risky Business with Patrick Gray and someone, and I don't remember who he quoted as saying like, uh, oh, this is a, a heap overflow, so therefore it's, it's not important. I'm like, what? What? We're, what? We're. I don't know who said that, but I believe it was his show no. I was listening to that they said that. Not not, not smart. Um yeah, no, actually, I always thought, you know, I try not to get down the rabbit hole of comparing the vendor-supplied version of, of OpenSSL versus the what's most patched, because depending on the OS you're running or other factors, you, you're going to see a big gap. So I'm saying if you're running 304, get on to 305. Um, but often the stuff's embedded. I'm thinking you're going to have to wait. You yep. know. Mm. If you're even running 304, which is... I mean, right? Yeah, if you're in 2004 not. LTS did had one dot. I mean, I could tell you exactly what it is. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah, but it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't the. It wasn't it, three dot something. It was you, the one one you throw, dot twelve. You throw this I back think. to IoT, and it's like you're running three oh what? No, you're like still on the point nine eight. <laughs> I think that's a saving <laughs> right. grace, you know. Right. With this one, is it is the newer version that is largely not embedded in a lot of these devices. Bleeding to your guys' point. edge, as it were, and it's yes. not really bleeding edge. It's just the, the modern. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, probably minimal exposure, but if you're in a 304, do something about it. Yep. Um, and if you're going to have to wait for you. If it's embedded, you're going to have to wait for the vendors anyway. Mm hmm. The whole supply chain thing. Mm hmm. But I still think the uh, PKI vulnerabilities are very interesting because they can be, I mean, it's complicated to implement. I mean, there's the opportunity for error is pretty high, and this was just done because of pressure getting 304 out the door, which we've never run into that before. No. And th this is an RCE. This is like a, th this yeah. is remotely exploitable, a heap right. overflow in, in, in SSL, in open SSL. Yeah. That's scary. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, I'm not trying to diminish the impact. I'm trying to say I can totally understand the person that did it mm. just because I know what stress and pressure are like. 
you be, know, I be, think we all do. Be an interesting uh, Shodan search query to run to see who's running. Right. Uh, OpenSSL version <sighs> three to four, three hundred four. You haven't done it already? No, I haven't. And mm-hmm. but but and and this brings me to a uh, a quote by uh, a human being who I very much love and respect, Zero Chaos, mm. Rick Frina, mm-hmm. who recently I saw in Discord says, Shodan is a list of vulnerable systems, not those you're permitted to attack. Correct. <laughs> well put. So, um, yes. There was a vulnerability in AWS's IAM Authenticator. I, I call this as the last one. Hmm? Yeah. The last one. Oh, uh, and I also had one really hilarious ransom payment one I wanted to end oh, with. Oh, I think we should end. That's should when go, you go to said that, that, like, it was... Go to that one. In my mind. I just wanted to point out, like, in the AWS one, there was um, an attacker can send two different variables with the same name, but different <sighs> uppercase and lowercase characters. <laughs> So yeah. like uppercase action and lowercase action, both variables in the vulnerable code are too lower. Like yep, most of us are familiar, yep. like Python yep. or any, like most, a lot of languages, you can uppercase or lowercase, whatever. Yep, they're uh, case sensitive imp- unless, input data. unless you convert and So them. in code, you can uppercase and lowercase them, right? Um, but the uh, dictionary will be overridden with the request to AWS will be sent with both parameters in their values. So like there was a, I think it's a, a like a input validation, not a lack of input validation, but like incorrect input validation where even if you're sending it to lowercase, what's sent to the back end is still both the uppercase and lowercase. And it was almost like a race condition might be the, the, the mm. it, there was a for loop that had that would process these requests in a certain way so basically that led to the bypass so that means a really in depth so if you click on mine went to port swiggers the daily yep, sto- swig story number 4 story number 4 if you go into port swiggers daily uh, swig you get to the researcher uh Gaffnit amiga is the and researcher I, and, the, and the I love producer. the researcher's last name is amiga right Mm-hmm. Because that brings me back. That brings you to the article that explains it in all of the glorious detail um, that you can read. But kind of, I was like kind of struggling classifying this vulnerability because it's a incorrect input validation, but also like a lot, almost a logic flaw in how the parameters were passed, so that you could you could bypass. Oh, uh, hey, um, re- yeah. real quick uh, on the next story, uh, I want to touch the Express LRS uh, drone yeah. takeover. Do that, then be- we'll talk about the be- hilarious ransom. Because ransom. we mentioned it in the beginning of the yeah. show. Uh, the big one that grabbed me about this when I saw, oh, a, lounge, a drone takeover, I'm thinking Ukraine, Russia, any of those consumer drones with DJI and all that stuff and all that stuff that's been going on. Uh, Express R- LRS is a protocol used for drone racing communities Mm -hmm. so it wasn't nearly as impactful as i thought it could have been like you could win drone racing stuff with this okay yeah the application is around the the drone racing community as opposed to some of the consumer stuff like dji and others that are being utilized as part of the ukrainian conflict and so forth so that was what i want to mention about that but now the last one is maastricht University, a Dutch university with 22,000 oh, yeah. students, um, had said that it recovered a ransom payment, uh, ransom paid for a ransomware attack that hit its network in December of 2019. The funny part is that the university said at the time it paid 30 Bitcoin ransom, roughly 200,000. Is that euro? Is Dutch? I think so. Is Dutch euro? Kroner? What is that? A uh, whole standby? Is, standby. Let's let's fact check that. 200,000 form Dutch? of currency that form was... Dutch is euro? Euro. Euro. 200,000 euro. euro at the time for the ransomware decryptor allowed the university to recover from the ransomware attack. However, um, the Netherlands Public Prosecution Service traced and seized a wallet containing the cryptocurrency paid by the university in 2019. Um, it paved the way to for the seizure to happen as early as February 2020. Blah 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 blah. The value of the cryptocurrencies found at the time um, forty thousand euro. Forty thousand euro. They're worth approximately five hundred thousand euro. So they more right. than double. Like 
basically what the story is saying is like if you paid a ransom three years ago and it gets recovered sometime in the future even the cryptocurrency market is was down right now yep. right but like right. Yeah. It, when you recover the wallet they actually made money right right so <laughs> they, just, they, they they paid 200,000 euros in they, big the equivalent of that in bitcoin yep yeah, right? they, they 200,000 dollars in euros uh to the ransomware ransomware got busted they recovered the wallet at the time of recovery of the wallet it was worth 40,000 euros they returned it to the university and by the time it got to the university and current prices, it was 500,000 euros. That's crazy. So they paid 200 and they got 500,000 back, even though it was down. So, like, by does the Netherlands 20%. <clears throat> Public Prosecution Service have like a building now in the, <laughs> at no. the university in their name? Like, that's <laughs> probably not. So, uh, the, the, the thing that got me is I saw an article on this, and the context was. Somebody was complaining that the, even with the increase in value, it didn't cover the cost of remediation. It's like, oh, it turns out they could, the decryptor didn't work on this one, so they had to like manually ah. restore the most expensive use case. I'm thinking, yep. you know, the recovery cost what it is. You got your money back and then some, which, you know, probably... It's better than would, some. Yeah. I mean, we there covered other... universities, Lee, right, that went out of, had to go out of business. I mean, yeah. again, at the time, we said like, that probably wasn't the only factor that right, led right. to there was probably right, other right, financial right. factors and in, in mismanagement that led to that but you know the tipping point was the ransomware attack but, i think the, it's it, it's kind of it means interesting and, and i mean let's be honest like a little funny that like you actually made money on a ransomware payment yep this, this this becomes like a question of the courts about how you sue for damages and so forth right so i have a friend that got was a victim of sim swapping mm mm-hmm. mhm and when they were a victim of SIM swapping, they had like three Bitcoin stolen from them. And at the time, the three Bitcoin was worth about $6,000. 6000 6000 That was a, some time ago yeah. now, right? Yeah. What's, was, Bitcoin, what's Bitcoin trading at know, now? I don't know. But, at, but by the time the case went to trial, yes. this individual was out three Bitcoin. And now that Bitcoin is worth sixty thousand dollars, and I'm well, and I'm throwing money out there, throwing values out there, but this between the time of, hey, I got hacked and they stole my Bitcoin, to the point where I'm now going to sue for damages. What are those damages? The cost yeah, of that right, right. V- that asset has increased tenfold. The, the course is all about damages, right, right, and, and like the my my friend was. Never really expecting to recover more than six thousand dollars of the original value of the Bitcoin, but right. that becomes but the twenty-four hour high, <laughs> according to Google right now, is about nineteen thousand dollars. So sixty thousand dollars, roughly, so, for three yeah, Bitcoin, right? Yeah. yeah, roughly. Yeah. So what are the damages? Is exactly. it the original price? Is it the current price? price? Is it the price when it was recovered? Is it, is it the like, price? Is, is it the price of lost opportunity? <laughs> right. Well, like that. Yeah. I don't know how that works. I don't know how that works either. Yeah. So with that, speaking of lost opportunity, it's about time to wrap it up. I agree. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching to this edition of Paul Security Weekly. Larry, take us out. Over and out.